I am joined today by Sir Sherard Cooper Coles, a British former diplomat. He has served, among other functions, as the ambassador to Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Afghanistan. He is now a senior advisor to the group chairman and the group chief executive of, of HSBC and a chair at China Brit Britain Business Council. Sir, it's an honor to talk to you. It's an honor to talk to you, and uh, it's a very interesting subject we're going to be discussing today. Um, I wanted to start our discussion with a quote. Uh, I've heard that when the former British Foreign Minister, Lord, Lord uh, Palmerston, received the first telegraph in 1840s, he cried, my God, this is the end of diplomacy. Do you think that diplomacy, as we stereotypically perceive it, uh, men in expensive tailcoats talking about world's problems at banquets, really did die the day these words were said? No, um, not at all. Quite the reverse. It speeded up. Uh, what it meant was that embassies abroad were better connected with uh, foreign ministries and chancelleries and uh, prime ministers and presidents' offices at home. So it speeded up the velocity and the volume of diplomatic interchange, but it certainly didn't make a diplomatic interchange uh, redundant. And in fact, as the world grows, as the number of countries grow, as international exchange grows, the need for people to manage those relationships is greater than ever. And of course, these relationships are now multi-channel. They're both private, face-to-face -face engagement, Zoom diplomacy, uh, to Microsoft Teams diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, there's no substitute for being face-to-face -face with the person you want to influence. Because all diplomacy is about getting ideas from one mind, your mind or the mind of your government, into the mind of somebody else. And to understand somebody else's mind, uh, it's always best to be face to face with them. Of course, I fully agree. Um, but is this true that before the revolution, we now may call the big data boom, expansion of internet, information and communication technologies and artificial intelligence, for example, diplomats, first of all, had to be analysts obtaining data from other countries, whereas now to be a diplomat means uh, to concentrate more on soft skills and interpreting received data to negotiate better? No, I, I don't think that's true because to find out what's really happening in Poland or Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan or Beijing, uh, you need to be on the ground. Uh, you can't uh, discover what's happening um, you know, just by going on Google or from open sources. You need to talk to people. The, the really exciting thing about communications is that an embassy abroad now can play a real role in the making of policy towards uh, the country in which it's based. So whereas in the past, uh, British policy towards France would be made in London and then sent down the telegraph wires or in the diplomatic bag to Paris. Now the British ambassador in Paris uh, probably every other day is on a uh, classified, i.e. an encrypted Zoom call with London. Uh, talking about policy and very often policy towards France will be written in the chancery, the political section of the embassy in Paris. And that was certainly true when I was in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia 10 years ago. Almost every day I'd be in a video conference with London talking about what was happening. Uh, many of the policy proposals would come from, um, come from the team in Kabul. So the old distinction between policy being made in capitals and executed in embassies overseas, I think has broken down completely. And that's a very good thing. But I heard that you said in an interview that it's always crucial to delve into the culture of the country you are um, sent to, is this true? It's absolutely true um, to understand the culture. Every country I've been to, except the United States. I've spent time living with a family, uh, speaking the language on what we call immersion training. I spent four months in Alexandria in Egypt, living with an Egyptian family. Before going to France, I lived with a family in Lille in the north of France. Before going to Israel, I 
learned Hebrew uh, in North London in the Jewish community there. And then before going to Afghanistan, I stayed with a Pashtun family again in North London, uh, did my uh, immersion training, getting under the skin of a country, knowing the culture, knowing about the cinema, the television, reading books. Uh, often reading the latest novels is the best way to understand uh, what, uh, how a people work. Um, apropos um, languages, do you think that the change that diplomacy faced over many decades may be noticed through the prism of languages? Because the main language of um, Western diplomacy in the 19th century used to be French, suggesting the, some European centralization of interests maybe, then yes. English, and finally we've arrived to this worldwide approach to diplomacy as we uh, represent now, Mandarin, Arabic, French, Russian, English, and Spanish being the official languages of the United Nations. Yes. So do you agree to that? Well, uh, English is, is the global language, is the, what the ancient Greeks called the koine, the, the common language. The, um, but of course, there are all these other languages. And of course, really to understand China, you need to speak Mandarin, really to understand Poland, you need to speak Polish. And you, uh, it's not so much that doing business with the Polish foreign ministry, you need to speak in Polish because they will speak better English than you'll ever speak Polish or I'll ever speak Polish. It's the, the nuances of the culture, the social interaction, the ability to talk to ordinary people in the street. In Saudi Arabia, I was dealing with a king who had had two years formal education and he spoke no foreign language. And I used my Arabic with him and I used it with ordinary Bedouins, but I never used it with the foreign minister who'd been educated at Princeton and um, spoke better English than I did. So, um, you know, it, it, it's different forms of communication but also of signaling and of cultural interpretation. Language is important. Of course, so would you say you have a passion for languages? Is, this, is learning of languages something you really like doing? No, it's very hard work. I like making jokes in languages and I like the play of words, but learning any language properly, it can't be done quickly. It's months and months of learning vocabulary and grammar and practicing and practicing and uh, uh, there's no shortcut and even for talented linguists um, it's um, it's difficult and it's perfectly possible to be a very good diplomat uh, without speaking any foreign language. Uh, plenty of American diplomats are very good diplomats, very few of them speak many foreign languages. Okay, I understand. Um... Uh, diplomat Alexander Karyagenis suggests that more volatile and dangerous world of ideology, cyber attacks, transnational threats, climate and environmental degradation, and even pandemic, they all made uh, being a diplomat in the 21st century more challenging than uh, now than it was before. Do you agree to that? Well, certainly the nature of the challenges is, uh, are changing, the need for diplomacy is as great as ever. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's going to be more challenging in the future. We've had two world wars in the last century, uh, plenty of wars in the present century. So I, it, it's certainly changing and I'm absolutely convinced that diplomacy is, as I've said several times, more important than ever to deal with these challenges. Governments need to people who uh, manage their external relations. So I guess the, the quote, uh, the quote, uh, when diplomacy ends, war begins, is true? Yes, up to a point, yes. yes. Okay. Um, Karagenis also says that the challenge of diplomacy is to never lie and never tell the whole truth. So yes. how do diplomatic negotiations and talks look like? How should diplomats approach these talks in order in order to fulfill their roles well? Well, uh, he that's he, he put it very well. You must, uh, I mean, you must always work out where you want to end up, 
what ideas you want to put in the mind of the other person. And you must understand what they, what they want as well. If you don't, uh, you will fall flat on your face. Britain fell flat on its face uh, in the run-up to the handover of Hong Kong, where we tabled ideas for so-called democratic development in Hong Kong, which anyone who knew anything about China would have known were not acceptable to the Chinese, either in terms of substance or in the way they were presented publicly to the legis Legislative Council in Hong Kong, rather than being presented privately first in Beijing. So it's about substance, but it's also about style and form. It's not just what you say, but it's uh, how you say it and when you say it. Of course, I've heard that uh, to be a diplomat means to be a maybe even better listener than speaker. There's a lot of truth in that. Okay. Um, what are, in your opinion, the features that describe a successful diplomat, say, 30 years ago, and what describes him in, or her today? Well, in 1947, the famous um, British diplomat, Sir Harold Nicholson, gave a lecture to the new entrants to what was then called the Foreign Service. And he listed a number of qualities of the diplomat. But he said the two which mattered most were a sense of humor and a sense of proportion. The sense of proportion? A sense of proportion. Understanding, you know, what matters and what doesn't matter, what's important and what's unimportant. And do, do you think that um, over the years diplomacy has been become more open and available to people of all origins and backgrounds? Do you think that yes, that it certainly has. Um, and certainly in Britain, um, the, you know, the social background of people in the diplomatic service is certainly open. And there's much more what's called public diplomacy, ambassadors tweeting, you know, uh, you know, using Facebook, using social media, using television and radio to get across their messages. Do you think we are on a way maybe to um, achieve parity in diplomacy? Is this possible? To achieve what? Parity. Parity? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean parity? Like the equal number of, um, of, men and women. of backgrounds and women and men. Is this possible? Is this a, Yes, yeah. it's certainly possible. I, I mean, I always thought, I mean, that most of Britain's top ambassadors are women now. I personally thought that women generally are better at diplomacy than men. They're better at understanding another person's point of view, they're subtler at, I mean, these are gross generalizations, of course, but are subtler at tailoring the messaging to the, to the audience, which is what diplomacy is about. Um, and, uh, you know, more than half the new entrants to the fast stream of the British diplomatic service are now women. That's very good to hear, I guess. Yeah. And uh, what do you think the art of diplomacy will look like in the future? Very much as it is today. Yes. The best diplomat in my team when I was ambassador in Saudi Arabia was a woman who left school, hadn't gone to university, but she was intellectually very bright, very confident, uh, and had a very good manner. And she could speak to senior princes, senior ministers, she was the first secretary in charge of energy policy, but also, you know, engaged with male officials, male ministers. She was absolutely superb at her job. Do you think that our, the diplom being a diplomat will change very much in the, you know, 50, 30 years, maybe? Do you It'll, it, well, it's changing all the time, but the essence of managing the relationship and what I find interesting is that, you know, I work for a great global firm and the, the firm actually needs specialists like me who handle our relations with governments of the world and can craft our messages to government. And so in a way, you know, great corporations need foreign policies, need diplomacy. Okay, so being a diplomat doesn't doesn't mean 
only a representative country anymore, I guess. It can, it can rep, it can. I mean, it, it's usually people who do it for firms are called government relations specialists. But that's what diplomats do for their own governments, government relations. And um, do you like such a picture that lies ahead? This future you, you yes, just... I do. I'm always optimistic. That's great. The only sadness is Britain leaving the European Union, which is a tragic mistake. Oh, I agree, unfortunately. Um, but what challenges will diplomats of the year 2030 face? What is ahead of us? 2030? Um, well, it'll, the big issue of our time will be uh, managing the rise of China and how America reacts to that. Uh, and a lot of the problems in that, you know, lie in the nature of the American Republic, in my view, and America's need uh, always to be top dog, uh, the nature of the American Constitution. It, it's going to require great statesmanship to manage it in an intelligent way that uh, preserves uh, security, peace and prosperity. What do you think will be the role of Russia in this American-Chinese uh, conflict? Well, I don't think Russia will be central to it, but um, Russia, as we've seen, you know, can, is capable of, uh, uh, you know, fairly robust disruptive activity of one kind or another. Of course. And... Um... So uh, you say that um, being a diplomat is, can, can we say that being a diplomat, um, because of this quote, when diplomacy ends, war begins, can we say that diplomacy is the safety valve of humanity? Is this, is this a true statement? Of course we can say that, yes. Um, okay, I want to ask you maybe for all, all of our participants who wish to um, pursue maybe the diplomatic career, um, what are your tips for, for being a diplomat? What would you well, read my book, Ever the Diplomat, uh, mm -hmm. because there's a chapter at the end on advice for people being who'd like a diplomatic career and realize that it has advantages, uh, great interest, traveling around the world, uh, great variety, but also great frustration. You know, uh, it it's, can be difficult for couples uh, to manage joint careers. It, it's disruptive being away from home. And it can be frustrating working for ministers with whose policies you may not agree or uh, whose policies you believe to be wrong. Um, yeah, I, I, luckily, I only had a very few occasions when uh, that was the case in my career. But it's not, you know, it, it's not an absolutely perfect career there, there are advantages and disadvantages so you should have no illusions about that in terms of uh, qualification uh, it's the ability to express yourself clearly uh, orally or in writing to make complicated issues simple which is a great gift uh, in life anyway and the ability to get on with other people and to get the best out of them all qualities uh, which um, are not unique to diplomacy. So you have to be charismatic, qualified, and you have to learn to give something up, right? Yeah, I'm not sure about charismatic. There are quite a few uncharismatic diplomats. <laughs> but you need to have an ability to get on with people. I understand. Um, thank you very much. That was the first episode of the What's in the Future interview podcast. I was joined by Sir Sherrod Cooper Coles. Sir, it was a pleasure talking to you. A great pleasure talking to you, Margot Zatza, and uh, very best of luck with the series. Thank you.